Hi there. Um, so let's get started. Um, a short, a, a few notes about uh, me and the uh, Data Artisans. It's a very special day for Data Artisans. It was founded by the original creators of Apache Flink, and as it so happens, uh, day of today, four years ago. So it's our birthday. And <laughs> a bit younger is actually our first product, which is the DA platform that was uh, announced in September 2017 and is now uh, generally available, which eases uh, the deployment of uh, um, Flink jobs and uh, the whole management of your application running on Flink. So what are we going to, what am, am I uh, going to talk about today? So first I'll give you a brief introduction about what is Apache Flink. And then we head on to the recent changes to it, which emerged in the release of Apache 1.5 just roughly two weeks ago. Um, and I give a brief outlook of what is in the, in the stages as of now, and will be uh, in Flink 1.6 and afterwards. So what is Apache Flink? Uh, in a nutshell, uh, Apache Flink allows you to do stateful computations over streams either uh, real-time or historic. It is fast, scalable, fault-tolerant, and in memory, or not in memory, but uh, on, on disk if you need large state. So the, um, it supports event time, uh, also processing times so with different notions of time that uh, arise with your applications. It has at least once and exactly once um, guarantees whatever you choose, whatever you need for the application. And as for um, Apache Flink, everything it sees is basically a stream. So if you have a continuous streaming program or a running application based on Flink, those will be basically unbounded streams, can start in the past and go on into the future, because uh, you, you don't know when they, were going, well, will, when they will end. And it also processes batch processes in the same way. So those streams will then be finite, finite applications uh, and batches. It could be that it started in the past and ended in the past, because you're processing historic data, or it started in the past, extends into the future, but it will end at some time. But for Flink itself, everything is a stream. If you want to use it, you basically have different abstractions that you can use. So it's kind of a layer. So in the middle, there's the uh, data stream and data set API, which is useful for stream and batch data processing. This gives you access to streams, to windows, some aggregations. Like in this example, um, you have some stream that comes from sensors. You, you group by those sensors, and you want to aggregate certain data uh, from those sensors in Windows. Below that API, you have more fine-grained control with the process functions. There you have uh, access to the events themselves, to uh, state of individual operators, to time, different notions of time, um, to watermarks. So this is what you would use to implement a stateful event-driven application. It gives you more fine-grained control. And there's a high-level abstraction, which uh, basically eases the entry level into stream processing. So there's a stream SQL and, st and a table API that basically allows uh, data analysts to write SQL queries that will then be translated into stream processing program and run on Flink. So I'll give some examples for those individual levels. So in the data stream API, you always start from sources. This is where your data comes from, where your events come from. Then you do some transformations, everything that you want to need to do, or want to need to do, like uh, assuming your, your source only had strings, you might want to parse them into, into some real objects that you will work on later. So this will be a transformation. Then you, like in this example before, uh, group this by, um, uh, in this example, the sensor, you have access to windows, you do sum over, uh, over the, this window, so this will be uh, windows where the window itself will accumulate state and aggregate this with a function given. And everything will end up in a sync. So stream processing program is always from the sources to the sync. In the sync, you can write 
to um, for the sources, let's say, and sources you would read, for example, from Kafka or any other source, then you do your transformations inside Flink, and the sync will either write it back to some 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 destination, also be Kafka or files or S3, or you could actually talk to to another service that is running. At the low level, you would have the the process function or coprocess function, where in, in this example you could join two different streams together. You would have to implement this in uh, either Java or Scala, and you get access to to every detail in those events uh, in the context from from Flink. So watermarks for time, the time itself, what time is it, and you are able to register timers. So you have very fine grained control over what you want to do, but you need to know what you're doing. And on a higher level, the SQL, it's uh, almost standard SQL, except for the, the tables are not fixed, but those are dynamic tables, because you work on a stream, you don't know when the stream will end. And um, it's basically almost ANSI SQL, with some extensions, like uh, Windows, uh, in this case, a tumbling window. Um, but you also have access to not only uh, to, to time, different time notions, because of the Windows yeah, processing time or even event time. So how large or small can Flink get? Well, arguably, the, the biggest user of Flink is Alibaba. They use Flink to sort of power parts of their system during the, the so really crazy um, shopping day, the singles day at the 11th of November. There at peak, we have roughly 470 million records per second that is processed through uh, Blink. Blink is their uh, fork of Flink, with ha which has a few patches on top of it. But they're slowly or uh, they're continuously contributing back to Flink. So the difference is getting less and less between Blink and Flink. So at, at the terms, in terms of uh, their jobs. Uh, there are thousands of different jobs running. They run very large clusters of over 5,000 nodes with 500,000 uh, CPU cores. So this is really big. And the second uh, example is Netflix. Their routing pipeline goes through Flink. And they have also, they're, they're also a very big user with uh, around 3 trillion events per day, over 2,000 jobs, lots of containers, lots of parallel operators. Um, but Flink does not have to be big. It can, can run in a single process. You could run it on your machine. You will not get a high availability, of course, because it's a single machine, but it does run there as well. Some users also use it on IoT gateways, and for debugging, it's also very useful to run in your IDE. So let's go to, uh, to the changes for Flink 1.5. First of all, Flink and 1.5 in numbers, it's been roughly five months of work where 106 contributors added code to Flink within over 1,500 commits. There were um, almost 800 Jira issues resolved and a lot of changes in the codes. One of the biggest ones is the changes in deployment and process model. So this is not only a big one in terms of code, but also in what enables us to do now and in the future. So what are different scenarios that we can use? And uh, if you want to use Flink, there are tons of different deployment scenarios. One of the common ones is to run it on Yarn. You can also use Mesos. You could use Docker and Kubernetes. You can set up Flink standalone, meaning um, running this on your machines uh, themselves, and so on and so on. There are so many different scenarios. And on top of that, there are different usage patterns. You could have a few but very long-running programs, or you can have many short-running programs, and you want to have a different mode for the two of them because there's some overhead of starting a new cluster. So there's job isolation versus sharing resources. If you have a few long-running jobs, you might want to have those, have those separate from each other, but if you have many short-running jobs, you might want to have a big cluster that is shared among those jobs. So you don't need to restart the cluster all over again for every small job. Um, and you want you, if, if you have a single cluster, you can also share resources. So not every small job will use the whole cluster. So there you would... Um, 
uh, go for the, the sharing part, which will be the session mode. That basically sets up a Flink cluster without a job, and then you can submit jobs into it. So it's a shared cluster for multiple jobs. The resources, the compute power uh, can be shared across those jobs. And as I said, it's, it's a, a separate thing to deploy the cluster and to submit your jobs to it. And then there's job mode, which will basically set up a Flink cluster for each job that you want. This is um, the best thing if you want separation between the jobs. So those changes in the deployment model have been introduced uh, in, in the Flink Improvement Proposal 6. This has been around for quite a while. It has been worked on and uh, initiated by uh, Alibaba and Data Artisans. It introduces generic building blocks so that we are able to um, create blocks for the, all the different scenarios that were mentioned before. Um, and we go into details a bit more. So those building blocks, uh, at the start, basically, you have one resource manager. This is cluster manager specific. So you have one for Yarn, you have one for Mesos, you would have one for Kubernetes, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and for standalone. This one may live across jobs and manages the available containers and task managers. So task managers are the basically your workhorse, but we'll come to this. So the resource manager's responsibility is to acquire and release resources. And then there's the dispatcher. This also lives across jobs and is the, the touch point for job submissions. If you have your CLI somewhere and want to submit a job, you will go through the dispatcher. And this spawns job managers, which exist now only for a single job. We go to the interactions between those in a, in a minute. Um, and this is where it is. So from the client, this can be the web UI or um, most commonly the, the CLI. You would submit a job towards the dispatcher. The dispatcher will then start a job manager for this specific job. And we'll, the job manager will talk to the resource manager to ask for slots. Says, well, g give me, uh, uh, this program has specifies parallelism of 20, give me 20 slots to run this on. So the resource manager will talk to Yarn, Mesos, etc., to spawn task managers. Those task managers, when they start up, they register with the resource manager. And eventually, the job manager can um, deploy the task on those task managers. So in Yarn, this is what it looks like. You, you tell the Yarn resource manager to, to spawn the application master, which will contain a dispatcher and the resource manager specific to Yarn. Um, uh, this is basically what uh, I showed before. And in Mesos, this will be quite similar. So those building blocks are very generic and uh, inter interchangeable where they need to be. So this is the per job mode. So what are the differences to the, the situation that has been there before? Uh, now the jars are in the class path of all components. This reduces class loading issues. That's one point. The second and maybe even bigger point is that we have dynamic resource allocation. So we no longer need to specify how many containers we need to run. Doing startup, you say your job is parallelism 20, and uh, it will ask for this many task managers. And then there's no two-phase sub job submission anymore. So um, in the, in the before, you basically spawned everything and needed to poll and poll and ask, well, is the cluster running? Is it running? Is it running? And then submit your job. This was working behind the scenes, but nevertheless was error prone. And for the session mode, it's not too much different. In the CLI, you would start your cluster. This is the one-time thing. You start your session cluster. This will spawn an application master consisting of the resource manager and the dispatcher. And whenever you submit a job, like uh, step three, you submit job A, you talk to the dispatcher. It will start a job manager for this particular job and ask the resource manager for resources. This will organize and start task managers which register with the resource manager and tell the job manager, well, I'm here, give me some work. And whenever you submit a new job, this will also go through this through the dispatcher. It will start a separate job manager, and the same process will happen again. So to wrap up this part of the deployment changes, we have a new distributed architecture. 
that allows Flink to support many different deployment scenarios, as shown. We now also have a native job mode as well as a session mode. Before, the, the session mode was kind of a hack, hacky thing. And the biggest change will be th that we now have full resource elasticity. So that's one step towards having dynamic scaling. And also very nice to have now every call to the job manager, every uh, job submission, etc., is going through REST. So you, you can have your own clients talk to, to Flink. Uh, it does not go through ACA anymore, but you can have basic standard REST calls towards it. So that's it for the uh, deployment changes. The second part will be around broadcast state, which extends the, the, the use cases for Flink. So imagine you have uh, some keyed streams where your events come through, and you want to match them against the common rules, the common set of rules that should be available to every parallel instance. This was not easily possible for. You, you could not combine a non-keyed stream w with a keyed stream. So this is where broadcast state comes in. To go into an example, you want to match stream A with some shapes against another stream of rules. So here you want to match um, objects of the same color with shapes in a particular order. For example, the, uh, the square, uh, first event should be a square, second event should be a triangle. Uh, so what you would do, you would create a key by first on the color those will be stored into keyed state at each parallel instance, in here like three parallel instances. And then you would need the rules. The rules would need to be distributed to all of the nodes. So they will be broadcasted. They must be stored there as well. And th this will go into broadcast state. Then you would need to connect those two. You would say, okay, this keyed stream works with this broadcast state. And whenever a new event comes in, like here for the first nodes, we have the, the, the square is already stored. We have the rule that we're waiting for a square and then triangle. And the triangle comes in, it will then be matched based on this. You can access the broadcasted state, you can access the rules, and then you can work on it. And with this, like what, what you could do before is to have a static set of rules. You would add this to your program, this will be fixed, and that's it. But what if you want to change? What if in the next iteration you want to have a look at something different? Um, think about um, uh, fraud detection. You might want to change your rules and not redeploy your job. So this is where the broadcast state comes in. So I won't go into details for the API. This is what the documentation is for, is good for. Um, but basically what we have, we can have a, a keyed stream or a non-keyed stream that we can connect to a broadcast stream. So um, this broadcast stream is non-keyed. It is replicated onto all, uh, all parallel instances. And it's identical on all tasks. Even after restoring, after rescaling, Flink takes, care of, Flink takes care of this. And you need the ability to connect those two streams to say, okay, this keyed and unkeyed stream uses this broadcast stream. And th this is used so that uh, in the processing of the keyed stream or unkeyed stream, you know, and, and you have access to this broadcast. All right, let's go to the next part. Uh, there have been some big changes in the network stack that were introduced in 1.5. So what Flink basically offers you on a, log on a logical um, point of view is if you have a subtask 1, a subtask 2, and those are connected with a, with a key bio, with a shuffle, with a subtask 3 and 4, it logically says there's a separate stream between task 1 and 3, task 1 and 4, and also task 2 and 3 and 2 and 4. This is an abstraction over the different things. So first, the subtask outputs. Every outgoing stream can be either pipelined and bounded. It can be pipelined and unbounded. It can also be blocking. Then there could be different scheduling types. Um, all those four subtasks could be scheduled at once. Uh, task three and four could be scheduled when one and two are complete. Or they could start already when the first event from uh, one and two comes in. 
and then there are different methods of um, sending the data through. You can have high throughput by buffering uh, some events and then sending bigger chunks of data if, you, if your events are small. Or you can have low latency by immediately sending even small data around. So this logical uh, separation makes a lot of sense. But under the hood, it's not that we have a separate channel for each of those communications. This will be way too costly. So what we do have, if there is one task manager with two parallel instances, like subtask one and two work on the same task manager, and subtask three and four work on a different task manager, but also the same like the task manager one and two, then all the communication that goes from task manager one to task manager two goes through a single TCP connection. So even if subtask, uh, so subtask one and two uh, will not have separate connections to the task manager two. So we have a single connection in there, and all the events that come through the, the queues will be multiplexed into this connection. So what happens there? Um, in, in this scenario, let's say there's an input, input queue on subtask four, and this has been kind of slow because it does a lot of computation or something. So buffers pile up on this end, and we now have a blue event also coming in for this task. But subtask 4 cannot really accept this. It is full. It uh, doesn't have capacity for this. So there's an event in the pipeline that we cannot handle. And the other subtasks, like uh, 3, will process its events. At some point, it will have no input data anymore. And this one single event in that TCP connection is blocking the whole pipeline. Because this does not get through, the next ones also don't get through. So subtask 3 will be idle. It will not do anything because subtask 4 was slow. And so I is a single connection there can block all of the connections, which was a severe um, uh, downside on performance in this regard. So what we introduced with 1.5 that was also uh, joint work with Alibaba, we added credit-based flow control. A receiver, first of all, tries to get resources uh, to uh, process data. Once it has acquired those resources, it will assign credit to the senders. Let's say receiver says, okay, I, I need uh, two buffers to, get, uh, to fill it with data from the sender. So it asks for two buffers. Once it has them, it assigns Two, it sends two to the sender, and sender, the sender now knows, OK, the receiver has two buffers available. I can send it two buffers. And they will not be blocked on the channel. Once the sender has sent and had put, has put data onto the communication, onto the TCP channel, it will not be blocked there at any time, because we know the receiver has the capacity to do so. And this gives a significant improvements uh, on first performance and second on, um, and on checkpoints as well. Because if we look back at this point, the events that might be in the TCP connection cannot only be events from the user, but also checkpoint barriers. So those will be um, small data chunks that we send through indicating that the tasks need to checkpoint their state. And uh, as you can see, in, in a very simple program, um, we already have a, a vast improvement on the checkpoint durations with credit-based flow control. And a second thing, we did not only introduce credit-based flow control into the network stack, we also improved it a lot in, the, in, in its overhead. So we re reduced the overhead of the network stack, and that way the balance between high throughput by buffering a lot of data and then sending big chunks versus sending every event on its own and lo having load latency is uh, further improved. So with uh, very full buffers, only flushing them every 100 milliseconds, was it, which is the default, uh, we have higher throughput because of the improvements in the, um, in the use. But even if you flush every five or two or one second or even send every event, there we have a lot higher improvement in 1.5 than in 1.4. Um, one more thing. Um, 
and it's a minor context switch. So um, we're now talking about state. So whenever uh, Flink's high availability basically is based on on checkpoints. So those checkpoints will store state somewhere in the distributed file system, and we have those checkpoint barriers passing through. Whenever an operator knows, okay, I have to checkpoint this my my state somewhere, it will store this into stable storage. It will do so asynchronously. There is a synchronous part which basically creates a copy or a copy on write, so, um, and then stores this part asynchronously onto some stable storage. So during failures, whenever a task manager fails, the job will be redeployed and we need to restore the state from the stable storage. And this is a significant burden if you have a very big state, like if you have terabytes of state stored somewhere, this needs to be loaded. So what Flink 1.5 introduced is to have some local state. So if your task manager survived, the scheduling will make sure that the task is put again onto the same task manager and during let's start over uh, during checkpoints you will not only store the checkpoints on a distributed file system but you will also have a copy local on your local disk so you have this uh, one copy on local disk one in distributed file system if your task manager survived then you can restore from the local file system immediately. You don't need to download stuff from your uh, distributed file system again. If it did not survive, well, for all those that survived, you restore locally, and for all those who didn't, you restore from the distributed file system. So there's a significant reduction in the time that you need to restore from a failure. Um, there have been some changes in the SQL API. There is a talk tomorrow, so I will not go into details that much. Uh, my colleague Fabian will present in more detail tomorrow. So we have some, some support for new joins, like windowed outer joins and non-windowed inner joins. And one of the bigger changes there is that we have a SQL client. So it's very easy now to access to um, Data on the sorry to process data on your stream. You don't need to write a Java or Scala program anymore and put your SQL query in there and submit this. You simply run the SQL client. You enter your your query and you then browse the tables like in this demo. You can view it at individual events. You will see the details basically. Uh, it's it's a very handy tool to do some quick calculations. Whoops. And now some parts for what's going on at the moment. So the release was roughly two weeks ago, and the next Flink 1.6 is targeted for end of July. So what's in the pipeline now, and what will go into 1.6 and even beyond? So the focus points are basically mentioned here is. First of all, support for Java 9. At the moment, we run Java 8 and Scala 2.12. Then the changes in the deployment architecture are continuing to give some better, um, um, to give some improvements for container environments to run on Kubernetes natively. And also, part of it is having the whole job submission run through REST. There's one single point that is not going through REST yet, and this is tackled in that JIRA ticket. Then there are two types of states that are currently only stored in memory. This is timers and operator state. We do want to change this. We do want to leverage our state backends for those two categories, so that not only we can have a very big operator state that is that does not fit into memory anymore, but can be stored on disk via RocksDB, but also uh, remove some old code there and get some new better performance, which is already showing there. Uh, then on the application side, we want to change and improve the bucketing sync that is now based on uh, Hadoop file systems to work with Flink file systems. Those file systems will then include like S3 and all of the other file systems that are available in Flink. Um, then there are changes in pipeline for uh, improving state evaluation 
to allow type conversions doing restores, which is not possible at the moment. And then there are a lot of changes in Stream SQL. We will have a new update by key for table sources. We will have more table sources, uh, not just Kafka, but also on and Kinesis and files and Kiveri stores. And the complex event processing CEP will integrate with SQL. We will use the match recognize clause to make it available there. And uh, one more thing, uh, the CEP performance, if used on, on uh, RocksDB, is currently not, or uh, can be improved and will be improved. There's an open pull request for this as well. And this is where I roughly made it on time. <laughs> and now we have some room for questions. In the new deployment models, you, um, uh, uh, how does that work with uh, Kerberos uh, KeyTab files? Do you, th is that still supported uh, properly? That's still supported. And it's, let me go back to, to here. Um, so you still submit your job. This will go through the job manager and task manager. So that basically is the same. The only thing that changed is the way that you request resources. So those will go. Um, we should go the same way, actually. Um, OK. Yeah. <laughs> Hello. Hello. So talking about uh, dynamic uh, resource allocation, is there auto dynamic resource allocation? Mm -hmm. Is there auto scaling feature, or how does it work to, to scale? Job? What's currently possible is that the Flink cluster itself can scale. So you start uh, like in session mode. You you spawn up only this one cluster entry point, and then whenever you submit a job, it will ask for the resources. Those resources, whenever a job finishes, will not be given back immediately. You will hold on to them for a while, and only give them back after some timeout, so you c which you can configure. If you ask for a separate, like a, a new job, like job A and B, as in the example, job B will ask for more resources. So the Flink cluster itself will auto scale the job. The, the, the job itself will not. I mean, you can, auto, uh, you can scale, but not automatically. What you would do would basically take a snapshot, uh, increase the parallelism, and start again. All right, does that answer your question? Any? <laughs> and uh, and about question about uh, uh, entry, um, uh, sorry, uh, s side inputs. Mm -hmm. Okay, I, uh, could you please remind? Uh, did you mention how this state can be updated with some timeout? Because in previously we were using pattern with sleeps. Um, to be honest, I'm not familiar too much with the side inputs. Um, yeah, broadcast state is side input. Still. Broadcast state is kind of a side input, yes, uh, but I don't think uh, I don't want to give out wrong information, so okay, <laughs> I can but only but guess but there. This, this uh, broadcast state can we update the rules yes. dynamically? So with, with some this, is out? this is one kind of side input, as you could say. It's not the generic, so for for everything. But if you need this pattern there, then that's. So I have another question. And so effectively, you can have your um, uh, Flink session running indefinitely, claiming only maybe one container. Mm -hmm. And only when you submit a job, it will claim additional resources and give them back a while after the job finished. Yes, Okay. that's Excellent. exactly what you can do. That's nice. Yeah. You will share the resources, though, uh, among different jobs. Uh, thanks. So um, I'm interested in the Kubernetes setup. Mm -hmm. um, what can we expect for uh, the next release? Is this uh, on on the same level what what is present, for example, for Yarn, or is it just a more smaller version of of uh, scheduling? 
Mm. I think th th there will be a first step of um, having containers, pretty uh, generic containers for task managers that will register with a resource manager, similar as here, where uh, like Kubernetes will do this scaling, meaning it will launch additional task managers. Those will register, similar to the session mode, will then register. Oop, sorry. Um, there. So uh, Kubernetes would. Would if it would scale, it would simply start up more task manager containers. Those containers will connect to the resource manager, and this will have them available there as well. And then the job submission goes through the dispatcher as well. Following this, um, are you familiar with the way uh, Spark is uh, working for submitting jobs? Are there similar plans to have the Kubernetes native way to submit a job? Uh, I'm not, sorry. <laughs> Thanks. All right, any more questions? Yeah, I'm wondering about the broadcast state. Um, you could do something similar previously by using physical partitioning, right? And by what? Using physical partitioning, um, physically locating the data, uh, broadcasting it to all the nodes, uh, and uh, then uh, Using uh, using the physical partitioning um, connection on a single machine, you could do, you could do make assumptions about the operator's location. And you c you could hack your way through. Yeah. Like um, whatever you receive the progress states, whatever put it into memory, and yeah. then it's of course available on the others. But you would not have any guarantees like exactly once um, between those two. Okay, so that's what, so what you're adding. Yeah. Thanks. Yes. Before that, it was only like say a hack. But this is a cleaner solution. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Then. So no more question. And thank you for your time. Okay. Thank you.